Should we be optimistic about the election of Javier Millet? Is the state the enemy of individual liberty? And is it true that if the Palestinians laid down their weapons, there would be peace today? We'll answer these questions and more on today's episode of Good Take, Bad Take. Hey friends, welcome to this episode of Good Take, Bad Take. This is the show where we gather takes that we see in our social media feeds each week. We go through them, give our opinion on whether we think they are good or bad, and try and explain the arguments that they're making and our arguments for or against them. My name is Britt, and I'm here with my co-host, Donnie. And before we get started, make sure to like, share, subscribe. You can find us on Instagram at Good Take, Bad Take Pod, and Twitter and YouTube at Good Bad Take Pod. Without further ado, let's get into some of these takes. So the first one comes from Creatrix, uh, and she tweets, or X's, or posts, or whatever. Hi, I'm pro-choice and also believe that life begins at fertilization. It is possible to hold these two beliefs simultaneously. I know, I know, I'm such a monster. I'm indifferent to the moralizing or bombastic rhetoric. Sometimes an abortion is just objectively the best option due to the circumstances. But let's stop using euphemistic language to downplay the gravity or pivotal nature of the decision, okay? What do you think, Donnie? Are we okay here with this well, one? I, I'm confused because her take says, I'm, let's stop using euphemistic language to downplay the gravity or pivotal nature of the decision, while earlier downplaying the nature of the decision by saying, I know, I know, I'm such a monster. She literally does the thing she... Maybe agreed. she actually meant it. Yeah, yeah, that would be nice. Uh, no, literally right there, she's downplaying the gravity of the situation. What what she means to say in this, but she's using very neutral and supposedly objective and you know moderate language, is let's not uh, downplay the gravity or pivotal nature of the decision as long as you agree with my right to make this decision. Because if you actually didn't downplay the gravital and gravity and pivotal nature of the decision you would recognize that there is no decision to make there in 99.9 percent of cases where it's not choosing between life you're choosing between life and some other you know lesser value of like convenience or things like that um it's it's one of those things where the the framing of the question also is assumes the perspective you have to take from, you know, from what she's saying. She says, sometimes an abortion is just objectively the best option due to circumstances. But what does best option mean? Best option for whom? It's never the best option for the, for the baby that's inside the mother. I don't think there's ever a best option for that baby. And even if you think that it is because the baby is going to have low quality of life or something like that, that's still not your decision to make. And it's not a mother's decision to make either uh, in, in the sense that your decision doesn't get to determine that, you know, oh, the quality of life is going to be so bad that therefore I have the right to kill something. That's never a justification that you would be able to use in the real world. Uh, or well, excuse me, not in the real world, but in the in the world uh, of of post birth humans, right? That's never a consideration that you can make with a baby or a child or even a, a live adult, you know, a, a grown adult in in a bad situation. You can never make the the judgment that oh, well, your quality of life is so poor that I'm going to just end that for you. Um, and so, you know, the the decision of what's the best option is never. It, uh, going to favor the baby it's that's never going to be abortion is never going to be the best option for them so this this is to me um somewhat of an insidious tweet yeah. because it's masquerading as the i'm the calm moderate in the room i believe i see both perspectives but of course my perspective is always going to lead towards the one that allows for the heinous killing of a child and if you if you're trying to you know say that that's uh, murder or or you're all you're trying to do is sensationalize it i'm trying to just be the cool moderate one here just chill guys look it's a life and it's okay to murder it and if you're trying to send you know sensationalize it you're just i don't i don't want to hear your moralizing like well you know it's not a matter of moralizing something that doesn't deserve it in the same way that it's like you know i don't think it's uh, an overreaction just for someone to scream stop if someone's lighting a match to to you know a, a gasoline tank inside of of of, of a, an inflammable house and there are 
certain justified responses to things. And just because you can say, hey, look, I can believe both of these things or I can believe this heinous thing and I don't want to hear your moralizing, that doesn't make you morally superior if the thing you are advocating for is morally reprehensible. So I think this is a terrible take uh, that's trying to masquerade itself as moderate, but every single perspective it takes is always go leading to one side. It reminds me of how Jordan Peterson would talk about how when we, as a society, if you get to the point where you're having the conversation about at what week you can terminate uh, an unborn child's life, there uh, many, many steps have gone wrong before then. I mean, it's it's like there's actually things way further up the line uh, that that need to be fixed in order for society to to properly function. And the reason this this post was so terrifying to me is that I think it's a sign of the um, kind of the, the the spirit that Nietzsche talked about in Beyond Good and Evil of the Ubermensch of people that are making their own values. And yeah. you can think of like Christian morals and and just the moral of the rest built on Judeo Christian values that you know life and innocence and things like that are top prioritized. It's almost irreducibly complex of a moral issue. Once you the, the, for a long time the abortion argument has been is it or is it not a life and if it is a life we all agree that it's wrong to terminate it um and so that's what the actual like argument has been about is like oh well isn't is a is a fetus at 1 week 4 weeks 12 weeks at 24 weeks is that uh, an actual life and we're saying we can't terminate after it becomes a life this person is saying that regardless of whether it's a life or not there's a value that sur supersedes uh whether it's a life and determines whether it's the best option and because of that, uh, we can kill. And what's scary about that, right, is that it doesn't actually stop. And and as as much as these folks used to like make fun of uh, uh, the right and people that are pro pro life for being like slippery slopers, it's like it doesn't stop at the unborn child. It it doesn't stop at even a born toddler. It doesn't stop at a thirteen year old or a twenty year old or you know at people that are really old. There, are, if there's a value that is higher than life, higher than uh, like some of these Judeo-Christian values that we've built a society on, then you can justify using your own warped framework, killing anyone uh, for the options and the scenarios and the outcomes that you deem as something that is, you know, morally uh, important. And it's it's very like paganistic, right? Like you look at societies that have had child sacrifice and like, well, it, it what really matters is that we make the rain gods happy or or some some similar type of crazy thing. and. It's like, okay, those values supersede the actual uh, shedding of innocent and the most helpless of blood. Um, and it's really, really crazy. I mean, you, you've, you think of like Nietzsche, as I've said earlier, talking about like it, the enlightenment and us taking these values and replacing God with them is not actually making us more intelligent. It's almost made us less rational in a lot of ways and more like the people, uh, more like a primitive people than, than someone who is quote unquote enlightened. You, you know, when you were mentioning the, being made people making fun of the slippery slope argument it makes me think that when when you're critiquing an argument and people say slippery slope as you're there's kind of two ways that you can critique something and one where the slippery slope uh justification is fallacy and one where it isn't and i think that that the problem is we're taught oh anytime you're making an argument of slippery slope it is a fallacy and i don't think that's true so i'll i'll try to demonstrate the point i'm trying to think through this as you know as we're talking and um so apologies if this is not as clear as i would like it to be but think about it in this way so if you are making an argument for instance that let's do it from like that the anarchist type perspective or something like that okay so uh saying like it should be illegal to have an abortion you could criticize that policy from the slippery slope perspective to say, um, well, like, I, I don't want it to be illegal to have an abortion because if the government says you can do one thing with your body, what's to stop them from saying they, that you can't, you can't do another thing with your body or you have to do something with your other body, right? I, and the slippery slope uh, critique there would be, well... Um, you're just using a slippery slope to say why this policy is bad in the one case, but not, uh, you know, nothing there actually says why it's a, a good or a bad thing to to stop abortion. You're just arguing from the the rationale of the slippery slope. So in that case, you could you could make the critique like, yeah, 
you're using a slippery slope fallacy, but that doesn't mean that every instance of the slippery slope uh, has to be a fallacy. So for instance, if you're saying something like, oh, the justification being used here to create to um, make abortion uh, uh, illegal isn't that it's protecting the rights of an individual against violence. The justification is that the government has a right to control your body. If that was like the legislative language and or like a court ruled that, oh, you're the government's allowed to prevent abortion because the government has a right to your body, then using an argument to say, oh, well, if that's the argument, then the government could now control your body in other ways, can force you to work in this way, can force you to not go to church. Can Then that's not a slippery slope argument because the justification for the individual policy is being critiqued. And so all of this sort of rambling nonsense I've gone on to say that when, when you know, conservatives have said, if we come to a culture that uh, says abortion is okay at some weeks, this inevitably leads to this child sacrifice further and further until you have post-birth abortions, that's not an argument of, or a fallacious argument because the what's often being argued there is not the only thing that's wrong with abortion laws, but it's just one of the principles of the abortion justification going on here. Because you're saying, if you if your justification is that it's only a matter of time or it's only a matter of weeks and it's okay, then that justification will be used in every other circumstance. And that's why it's not a red herring. But that's also not the only argument, of course, that they make, which is to say, if you allow abortion and, and you allow this, it is murder and you allow it, then you are only going to allow murder in more cases because of the precedent you set. That's not a red herring because the entire principle of allowing a, an abortion means that you are justifying murder in one yeah. case and therefore that can always that principle will always expand so again a, a little a little uh not as tight as i'd like my argument to be here but i'm just trying to think through this the red the red herring fallacy or excuse me the uh slippery slope fallacy is almost like there's like slippery so, slope fallacy fallacy where it's like yeah, just throw yeah. the slippery slope fallacy to completely ignore that principles can lead to further ramifications well yeah that like you're saying it's it's um like the argument of reducto ad absurdum like that's an actual method of argument for for you know trying to make a point and a lot of people will like confuse those two when yeah. when it's being made and i am th like the argument that we're making is is a combination of that and slippery slope but not in a fallacy way and that like right. if you take this principle to its natural conclusion this is where you arrive and exactly. uh and what's interesting is that because we have enough time on the horizon, um, like or not time on the horizon, but we have enough of a time in the past for us to understand like, oh yeah, predictions about this principle have played out the way that we anticipate them. It's almost like if you set a rule in some sort of program uh, and then you watch it play out, you're like, okay, yeah, the program does follow this rule. Um, and when we get rid of these you know, base level society morals, it eventually leads to, and like we're seeing in the Netherlands and in Canada, uh, not only are the unborn the ones that can be killed without discrimination, but it's also people that are uh, helpless, like old people. Or uh, I, I mean, we just saw this in um, in the UK. I can't remember. I think her name was Ari. Um, oh yeah, a, a two year old girl, you know, has a genetic disease. Was going to be transported to uh, Italy to be taken care of with some treatment that was experimental, but like had a chance at saving her. And the courts ruled that it was not in her best interest uh, to be transported there. And so even though the parents wanted to take her, uh, they were not allowed to. And she was forced to be uh, she was forced to stay in the UK and, and die uh, there, which is which is very sad. And that's kind of the, yeah, the, the, the inevitable conclusion of these type of morals being uh, ripped apart and then the morals used to justify decisions like this. Yeah. The last thing I'll say on here is uh, the other thing you'd mentioned earlier is that you know, at first they were, it was always, oh, you know, is it a life or isn't it? And and this is always the tactic of people who want power in one way, shape, or form is they have an outcome they want in mind. And it they will use whatever tactics it takes to get there and they will throw the, them away as soon as they're no longer useful. Yeah. And the problem with the is it a life or not is that technology and, and medical science it continues to get better, continues to prove the assertions of the pro-life that no like a, you know a fetus is a living organism it is a human it it has 
an experience, whether or not it looks like us, it, it removes the argument of viability that they use. So, so technology and science is moving towards ways that that really justify the pro-life argument. But they're scrambling at this point to now say, well, we don't need that. We, our yeah. justification goes beyond whether or not it's a life. Um, it's we we need to get to a culture of just accepting that what might what may be best for someone doesn't matter. It, it might include killing such a life, and and they'll downplay the value of the life. They'll do all kinds of things. But like you said, they they what used to be is it a life or not is rapidly changing to a culture that is okay with child sacrifice in some way, shape, or yeah. form. Yeah. All right, moving on to our next one, we've got uh, a comment on a t- on a Twitter post by. Um, by a user and the first user writes uh, it's still totally unclear to me how much Malay is actually a libertarian and how much of it is just kind of a vibe that he's superficially gone with this is an invitation for people with strong opinions to reply Uh, to add some background uh, a libertarian kind of from our camp of libertarianism uh, Misesian and and anarchist anarcho-capitalist won the presidential nomination in Argentina uh, which is which is very very exciting. So there's a lot of discussion about whether he actually believes in some of these things that he's he's uh, he's been talking about on the campaign trail or not. Um, it's probably the biggest office that someone of our persuasion has ever held. Um, may, may, I believe so, actually. Yeah. I um, think so. so so this this guy is inviting people to to debate this. Um, and someone writes, and this is the post that we're going to be critiquing. Don't know, don't really care. Electoral heroes almost always turn out to be highly disappointing public choice, and so on. And this one carries the additional risk of tarnishing the name of an ideology that is so tiny as to be tarnishable by a single prominent individual. What do you think? Should we be, uh, you know, bright and happy about this or is there kind of a a dark lining on it? What I will say is I think that the the cynicism of this take isn't entirely unwarranted. I think the yeah. last line is actually a fairly reasonable thing to be concerned about, right? To say, uh, 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 you know, a niche ideology that's small enough that a single person could tarnish its reputation. That is true. And and there are other things to be concerned about in that, you know, Argentina, of course, has gotten to this point by having 143% in, you know, inflation and like over 40 decades of leftist rule that has just left their country in tatters and in shambles. So it's not like he's going to come in and everything's going to be sunny and glorious from the first moment. I, so I, so I get that cynicism and I also get the cynicism of disappointing politicians. That's true. However, you have to start from some kind of a point. And I guess to me, it's like, would you rather start from someone who's like, I read Robert Murphy and you know, Murray Rothbard and Hans Hermann Hoppe. Like, would you would you rather start from there, or would you rather start from like I don't know, uh, like Mitt Romney? Like, we need smaller government while I create you know a state socialized healthcare system. Like, I, I to me it's it's like look, I get not being as excited about a politician being elected. I, like, I I can understand cynicism around that, but I think at the very least it, you should be happy that the public responded to the message in such a way as to show that even if he is disappointing, there is somewhat of an appetite for the ideas that he is saying. And that should be the thing that we're really excited about. And I hope for our sake, for their sake, for, for, for the world's sake, that Malay is awesome and, and sticks with his principles and, uh, slashes the state and turns that country around. I really, really hope he does. But even if he doesn't, we should be happy to know that you can win on these messages. And moreover than winning political office, you can win people's hearts and minds to follow uh, that kind of a vision forward. And hopefully we can we can sort of channel some of that and and work on messaging here in the States to turn this country, uh, again, even if the politicians don't follow, if you can get the people to follow, then that's what really counts. Yeah, I your argument for it is the, the exact same as mine. I think that I um I am also skeptical of anyone that promises puppies and rainbows, you know, getting into office and usually they they do that and then they just bring about doom and gloom. Um and they like Tom Woods says, no matter who you vote for, you always get John McCain. The thing is, it's like a lot of those those folks, at least here in the United States, are they're advocating for their ability to have the power to make these things come come about 
Whereas Malay literally has a video of him with a whiteboard and every single ministry of everything. And he's just, he's like the ministry of education gone, you know, and he's yeah, just he's like propaganda. It off. Boom, yeah, boom, gone. And it's, it's so awesome. So it's like the strength of his message to win really resonated with people in almost such a way that it will transcend him as a candidate. And that yeah. like, regardless of whether he succeeds or if the, the lizard people grab him and they replace him with someone else that does something the exact opposite. Um, like that idea that he has put out there that has resonated with people enough to vote for him, uh, for him to win, you know, the uh, a country like Argentina to win the election and popular support there. I mean, that like that's huge. That's like an entire generation totally being changed. And so I think it's people that are like getting down on because like, well, he's still a politician, you know, as Obi-Wan would say, like it's like, yeah, he is. And. He does hold office and he holds power. And yeah, he kind of has some views on like Israel and Ukraine yeah. <laughs> and things that are not super great. But like, look at the the fruit of the public and his discourse and how it's caused it to shift. And it's like, that is undeniably positive, undeniably good. And I think one thing that we've seen, at least even in the Trump era, right, is even when, and I'm not saying this is for everyone, but Trump's, how extreme he was in terms of his his rhetoric about how to do things and how it was taken by the public like it moved people in such a way that it has transcended like it is now a verb or not a verb it's like a it's a it's a descriptor of of a ideology trumpian like it's a very trumpian way to like be a politician like vivek ramaswamy is a very trumpian candidate and so like those ideas whether they're good or bad or indifferent uh like we live in a, a time and age with the internet and just how everyone kind of thinks a little bit more independently in some ways uh, that it can kind of grab on. And when the the person who is initially the vessel for those ideas maybe departs from the, uh, the straight and narrow of those ideas, like people still carry them on. And at least that's what I'm hoping for uh, down in Argentina and especially up here in the United States. That like, oh, wow. Okay. Like you can win because that's kind of a, the the Prague caucus of the Libertarian Party, uh, rest in peace. Uh, they, you know, their argument was that well, you can't win on extreme rhetoric, you know, extreme Mises caucus level rhetoric. Um, but it's like nope, like this guy won, and he won the presidential seat uh, in a country like a significant country um, in you know our the Western Hemisphere. So uh, I, I think it's a really great moment in 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 history, and I'm excited to see what happens. But even if he doesn't live up to our expectations, even if he is a net negative uh, in terms of how he manages Argentina. I think the movement and the ideas that he got out there alone are are good. I, the, the, the last thing I'll say is I think the other thing that's so good about his bold messaging is that he will be able, you know, even if he doesn't govern the way that he's campaigning, he's he's campaigned on such bold and stark ideas that it will be obvious if he's not following them. Yes. You know, it's like if he doesn't kill the Department of Education and it, if a Department yeah. of Education still stands, then you know that he didn't do that and you can't cr criticize him for that. You know, it's like it's one of those things where Trump almost has has the weakness here because Trump campaigned so heavily on doing things like, no, you know, um, no uh, foreign entanglements and things like that. And even still, it, it was like he still got us a little bit involved. He still had us, you know, we still dropped bomb. We still were doing our our existing engagements in places like Yemen and stuff. But but for what it's worth, his stark anti-interventionism really did bring about a pretty notable, you know, no new wars yeah. line from people to the point where even if it wasn't a perfect, it wasn't as like blatant as like, oh, like ripping the Department of Education and literally abolishing it. It, it was it was a stark enough campaign promise and it was kept relatively close enough to the point where a lot of people actually look at that and say, look, like you can hate everything else about Trump or you can hate Trump, but we didn't get into any new wars. And, and you know, it's not perfectly accurate. But it's a far cry from what we even have with Biden and what we had with Obama and Bush before him. So when you when you campaign on something that's bold and, and, and definable clearly, when you do or don't do uh, the thing that you've promised, it's hard to criticize. Like it'd be very hard to criticize Trump, for instance, on immigration 
policy, you know, saying, oh, we need closed borders and, and we need a wall. It'd be very hard to say, look, we had Trump and immigration didn't change. You could say, yeah, well, Trump didn't build the wall and that sucks. But building a wall is still a good idea. You know, just for yeah. an example, not not saying it necessarily is. But if you were saying the policy of building a wall will really fix our immigration, you can't really say it doesn't work right now because the problem was Trump didn't build the wall like you promised. That's a yeah. problem of Trump, not a problem necessarily of the wall the idea. ideology. So hopefully, uh, hopefully Millet does good things. And if not, I think it will be very hard to pin it all on an ideology that's so starkly defined if he doesn't follow that ideology. Yeah, that's a good point. I right, moving to our next one. We got a Twitter user and they write, or they first post a picture or uh, they're reposting a New York Post post uh, that writes, <laughs> $16 for a burger, fries, and soda. McDonald's customer slam franchise fume that it is no longer affordable. And this user writes, weird. I thought this was only supposed to happen if we raise the minimum wage. This is... Just such an ignorant post. I don't know if this was meant as a bait. It went mega viral. And the thing about it is if you if you are so, I don't know, binary in your thinking that your the argument of, hey, if you raise the minimum wage, prices go up. And your interpretation of that is the only thing that will make prices go up is minimum wage increases. I don't think I can help you. That's like, it's like you're thinking about prices like a teeter-totter and that there's only one variable on one end that will affect price. And it's if, oh, you know, oh your argument is if, the, if you raise the minimum wage and prices go up. Well, prices went up and we didn't raise the minimum wage. So checkmate. It's like, I, I mean, it's just bafflingly stupid. It's like saying, hey, you told me I'd only drown if I, you know, help, tried to breathe in a pool. And I stuck my head in a toilet and I still drown. So I guess you're not going to drown in a pool then. Like, like, it's just like, there's, there's just no words for how unintelligent this take is. Uh, and I think he got rightfully ratioed. <laughs> well, the, it, it is in lockstep with folks who believe that labor is like the only cost associated yeah. with, with any product. And like, I guess from like, if you kind of do the gymnastics thing, like it's kind of true because like, it's required to produce things, but like at the end point where the product is delivered to the customer, like it's not the only, it is not the only, uh, the only input and output and cost associated with it. I think we actually had a take, uh, maybe it was in cringe post when we were, we were doing that show, like where a person like did their math of like how yeah. you could raise the minimum wage to $40 for, for, uh, a fast food worker because like oh well you've got four people working you know 10 hours a day and a big mac you know like they, they're selling it for 16 dollars like they could easily pay they're because they're selling 100 big macs every every you know hour or whatever that's like yeah but that's not like either every big mac has like a fixed cost associated with it and then there's like a variable cost associated with how many you sell and 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 the overhead and all these various things and it's like yeah labor is like a small portion of that like labor is actually like a liability and that like it could not be productive when it's on site at least the costs associated with the product are like fixed in some way and that's like okay i know what they're going to get but outside of that entire philosophical blunder that that leads to this type of idiotic post i mean we have raised the minimum wage so even if even if there was no like other input it was a teeter-totter like you're saying like we have raised the minimum wage <laughs> like here in, in washington state we raised it uh, across the country we, we've raised it and maybe it's not raised in proportion to you know the amount of uh 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 like how much the burger has uh, or that meal has like increased in price but then you look at like okay well we have printed money and like that has caused like maybe you should just consider that um, also a minimum wage raising because we are putting more money out there to pay for services and um you know social programs and welfare programs that people get benefit from without actually producing anything to, to from which to buy it and it's like okay well that also raises costs so it's just, it's like this type of analysis arises because people don't, because it's, it's really interesting. Like if you think about the world before like the internet maybe, or even before like the abundance that allows us to have McDonald's in the first place, like people don't spend time thinking this way because they're kind of forced to be in reality. The only reason people are allowed to have a take like this and like spiral into like a headspace that allows them to write these words without thinking it through is because we have so much abundance. And I think we should be asking ourselves like, 
how did we get to that in the first place? Like, it's like, oh yeah, it's like free markets, capitalism, the ability for entrepreneurs to take risks, uh, for us to set prices at $0 an hour so that we can eventually make a future where people are much richer. Um, but unfortunately, you know, that age, age old cliche of, of good men or, you know, hard men create, or good men create good times, weak men create hard times uh, is really true. And this unfortunately is a take from a weak person. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I have too much more to add. <laughs> All right. On to the next one. We've got Jonathan Casey. And uh, he was writing, this is last week, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy uh, wrote how uh, when he was going to like lay off huge portions of the federal government, uh, the way he would do it is by whether you had an even or an odd social security number, which is really funny. Uh, and he's like, we could lay off half and everything would still be working okay. Um, and Jonathan Casey and various folks of his persuasion in our party uh, did not very much like that. And he wrote, libertarianism isn't, getting, isn't about getting rid of the state. Libertarianism is about increasing individual liberty. Sorry, not sorry. What do you think? I, it's really weird. I, I, I'm trying to understand this take. He's saying libertarianism isn't about increasing individual liberty. Libertarianism is about increasing individual liberty. He's just repeating himself saying it isn't, it isn't, because getting rid of the state is increasing individual liberty. Uh, this is a really dumb take because it's it's one of those things where, okay, if we're talking about the end goal, yes, it is about increasing individual liberty, but getting rid of the state is like a necessity of that, even if you're a minarchist, like, like he is right. Even if you're, you believe that there, there, there should be a, a skeleton frame of the, the state to pr protect and preserve individual rights and liberty. And yeah, yeah. That is the point of libertarianism in a sense, but you don't get there when you have a state that specifically inhibits you from exercising individual liberty and so to that point libertarianism is about getting rid of the state it's about getting rid of a lot of the state if not all of it if your point if if you want to maximize i i mean it, this is just such a uh a non-point such a non-issue it'd be like saying for instance like you know um ordering <laughs> ordering fast food isn't about having something to eat it's about getting nutrients into your body. It's like, okay, sure. Like, that's the point. But in order to get the nutrients, you have to eat. Like, that's, yeah, hypothetically, let's get an IV and inject the nu nutrients directly. It doesn't matter what the what the technical end, increasing individual liberty. Y yes, that's the end point. But you can't do that if you have a state that is dead set on killing your individual liberty. And so, you know, when it comes to, like, Vivek's specific take, I, I don't know if that... that it's my favorite that he would do it that way, but sure. I would much rather that happen than not have that amount of people fired, right? Like if I have to pick a world in which <laughs> he uses the social security method or a world in which he does things more deliberately, but doesn't get rid of that number, I'm choosing the social security method because what he understands, or at least purports to understand, is that at the core of the issue is that there is a bureaucracy and, and, you know, by proxy, basically the state, there's just a, like, like the mass of the state that prevents individual Liberty, that prevents things from getting done, that prevents Liberty from flourishing. And so in order for, in, in, in order to increase individual Liberty, you just have to get, get, you have to gut it. You have to get rid of it. Um, so yeah, maybe that's not, maybe that's not the end point philosophically in a sense, but when you have something that is the antithesis of your philosophy of individual liberty, then yeah, your philosophy kind of is about getting rid of that thing that is the antithesis to your, yeah. to your philosophy. Yeah, they're diametrically opposed. I mean, the analogy I thought of was like chemotherapy isn't about you know getting rid of cancer; it's about keeping the patient alive. And it's yeah, like yeah, exactly, it, it's, exactly. It's not <laughs> that cancer. I, I I mean to to take like I had a family member who had cancer and beat it once and then it came back, but in a very small amount that would not necessarily kill them right then in that moment. But it's like, well, you know what? It's there. And it's inevitably, this is going to grow to the point where we're going to have to 
either you will die or we're going to have to do something about it. So let's just start now getting rid of it. And it's like, yeah, cancer is diametrically opposed to someone being alive. Yes, like all medicine is about just keeping a person alive, not necessarily just killing cancer. But like you're being pedantic in the way that you like and, and about all of these different words and all the different phrasing. And it's like, I think that maybe the argument these people would say, it's like you need to love freedom and liberty more than you hate the state. But I don't know. It's just kind of like, you it, again, apply that to the entire cancer, uh, you know, analogy or compare that to the empire, you know, in Star Wars. It's like, yeah, like, I guess there's a world where that might be the case, but not when it's like inherently this is destructive. It's a destructive force that you cannot have liberty if there is a state. And yeah, the, the state is not the only way that liberty, individual liberty, uh, you know, is killed. It doesn't flourish. I think you and I would also argue that like having, uh, you know, a moral society and people that uh, that want to behave in a trustworthy and good way, that's also something that's important to have increased individual liberty. But by far and away, the biggest barrier to individual liberty in our lives and everyone's lives is the state. Um, and I don't think there's anything even, I mean, the, the close second doesn't even come close to it at all. If we got rid of the state, or if we even got it to, to, to a minarchist level, you're still excising a huge portion of it. Um, and so, yeah, like you're saying, it's kind of like the what is a woman thing. You can't use the same definition, you know, to describe it. And John and Casey's doing that, doing that here for, for individual liberty. He wants individual liberty and he doesn't want individual liberty. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, you know, if the, if the, if this is in the context of a discussion about the philosophy of it, then yeah, I actually would say, okay, like, like maybe this, maybe this is something we need to talk about and, and meaningful because of the points that you brought up where, you know, uh, increasing individual liberty is not only about getting rid of the state. It, it is more encompassing than that. But I, I do think that the way that he's positing it here doesn't feel like he's trying to say that Liber uh, increasing individual liberty is a, is a bigger thing that's inclusive of getting rid of the state. It feels like he's trying to pit them against each other a little bit. And I, the way that he's putting it here in the context, it looks to me more like the meaningless line from Rose in Star Wars Episode Eight: Like, we don't win by killing what we hate, but by saving what we love. And it's yes. like, okay. <laughs> Like that's fine, except that the as she dooms gonna... the entire resistance to to death, you know. Yeah, it's like the only <laughs> the only way that you're gonna save what you love is by destroying the thing that's coming to crush you, you know. Like, um, and so, so yeah, it's I I mean I even think about it in, in if we're talking about like bigger philosophy, like theological terms, like yeah, like you know, um, Christ coming back to to redeem people and give us everlasting life. Like, it's not about getting you know christianity isn't about getting rid of sin it's about glorifying god and enjoying him forever it's like okay yeah but he does that by eliminating sin like sin is getting rid of sin is a necessary precondition to the the eventual glorification uh in eternity so it's yeah. it's just like no matter what philosophy you look at you can make these parallels uh but at the end of the day even if your bigger picture philosophy of what you know, the end goal of, of libertarianism is or or whatever philosophy you're looking at, if there's something that is a necessary precondition to achieving that end goal, then your ideology is at least somewhat, if not in large part, about doing that prior precondition. Um, it's like saying writing, writing, you know, writing a novel isn't about putting words on a page. It's about telling a story. And that's fine. But if you're writing a book, putting words on the page is a necessary precondition to telling that story. So it's it's one. Of, it's just there's so many ways we can show how pedantic and dumb this is. But even if you're technically right, I, I think in the context he's presenting it, it's not at, it's not helpful. You're not. Yeah. You're, you're the only thing you could possibly like convince someone of is that getting rid of the state isn't as important as it is, and that's not helpful to increasing individual liberty. So to me, this is a bad take because it doesn't achieve anything uh positive in this unless he's going to suggest maybe in a follow-up thread of the things that you need to do beyond getting rid of the state but the way that it's shown here it seems like it's more like he's denigrating the idea of getting rid of the state which is a weird thing for a libertarian to do yeah all right moving on to our next one we've got joshua reed equal and he writes if israelis puts if if israel puts down their weapons they face genocide and the end of their existence 
If Hamas, if Hamas puts down their weapons, Palestine can be liberate, liberated. Both sides in this conflict are not equivalent. What do you think? I I don't know where to start with this. It's, <laughs> it's so frustrating. This, it is. It, it is constant red, uh, or excuse me, straw man arguments every single night, every single day. It's a complete mischaracterization of what's going on. Like, oh yeah, what <laughs> what we're complaining about is Israelis just holding weapons up. Not we're not complaining about them targeting civilians and actively going out. The 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 picture he paints here is like. A, a, an image of Israel standing on its own border, holding up weapons, you know, against sort of an enemy. The reality is that what we're complaining about is when they go in and target areas that have women and children, when <clears throat> we complain about things like, you know, shutting down electricity or water to areas with civilians, when we're talking about uh, even the, the conditions of treating innocent people who aren't part, part of Hamas, who, who, this, you know, in this take, Josh Reed equal would say that they should be liberated. At least it would imply. Um, it, it's about all kinds of things that aren't Israel's right to directly defend itself. No one he, that I know of has a problem if Israel does targeted assassinations of the leaders of Hamas in non-casualty inflicting ways. But the reality is, they created Hamas. They've created collateral yes. that will hurt innocents. That will continue to fuel conflict in that region. And more and more than anything else, uh, we just don't want the U.S. to to be involved there, like because that's only going to escalate things. No one is saying the sides are equal, or it's like they're they're different sides. There's different problems on each side. I'm just so tired of it. It's like, do we really have to go over this again and again? I I I, I don't know. I the the problem with these types of idioms and the the you know, the one liners that that the pro Israel lobby puts out there, you know, this one and the, uh, you know, they, they never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity uh, talking about the, the Palestinians. Like, is that it just oversimplifies the entire conflict. It ignores history and makes the belief that like history started on October 7th or in 2006 or whenever it's 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 convenient. Um, and like I. I guess like if I had to to dumb it down to like a, an analogy, like you had a, a family restaurant and a bunch of people in 1948 came in and they had the backing of some other restaurants in, in, in the countryside. And they, with guns, forced everyone in that restaurant, including the owners, into a closet in the back. And they hold them there at gunpoint. They're not allowed to bring anything in or go out or do anything. And they occupy it. And now, you know, the folks that are in the closet, you know, 60, 80, 100 years later are building bombs and like killing patrons that might not have anything to do with that original conflict out in the normal area. It's like, yeah, both things suck. But like, that's the the reality of what happened. There was an injustice that occurred in 1948 uh, and there's injustices occurring now. And no one is saying that it's good what the Palestinians and Hamas did um, on October 7th. But like, as you said, you know, and, and what as what Josh Riekel says here is that. You know, if Hamas puts down their weapons, well, who gave them weapons in the first place? Like Israel gave them weapons, you know, through funding, through supporting them, through also not backing the PLO when there were elections. And uh, did you watch the Laura Loomer debate with Dave Smith? Laura Loomer? No. Dude, you got to watch it. Like oh, he no. just destroyed her. They were talking about this whole deal. I mean, I watched, she was like, I watched the Austin Peterson one and that was like, that was a crap show. Yeah, this one was pr this one had similar things go on, but like he just destroyed her. Oh, um, yeah. And she was saying that like uh, she's like, well, give me, you know, you know, uh, how, how has Israel created Hamas? And and Dave Smith literally pulled out Benjamin Netanyahu's own words. And it was like, he literally said it to the Likud party. Uh, he said it in this Israeli journal. Uh, and you could see a video of him saying it. Uh, at this, when he's at the house of someone. And she's like, well, I need you to present evidence. He's like, I just gave you three pieces of evidence, like three sources I've cited to you. And like the reason that Benjamin Netanyahu and the Likud party and Israel wants Hamas in there, wanted Hamas to have power, is because at the root of their motivation is that there is no Palestinian state, that there's only a single state solution, which is Israel rules, rules all of it. Uh, if they can separate the West Bank and they can separate the Gaza Strip from each other, and then they can have someone as extreme as Hamas in 
the Gaza Strip. Like no one on the international stage, and this is Benjamin Netanyahu's words paraphrased, no one is going to take them seriously. No one is going to give them a seat at the UN. No one is going to feel good about advocating for their rights if you have a terrorist organization in charge of it. And what people will say is like, well, okay, even if like Israel funded and kind of propped them up or whatever, uh, the Palestinian people still voted for them, you know, to be in place. It's like, well, that's still, that, even that's not true. And even if it was true, uh, it's not moral justification for us to totally obliterate them. And I, I, have you seen the stuff going on with like, uh, Donnie's been out and about. That's why we've been delayed on podcast. So that's why I'm asking him uh, if he's if he's seen some of this stuff. But they scrubbed the internet of like bin Laden's letter to America because um, a lot of like people on TikTok and stuff found it. And, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the folks on TikTok necessarily and the people that would post this. But like people are realizing like, oh, yeah, it's it's not that bin Laden hated us for our freedom. They hated us for the various types of atrocities we were doing over there um, and the way that we would motivate people to, you know, uh, the, the the amount of they had a thousand nine elevens uh, for every nine eleven that we've had. And it's like, yeah, there are like motivations in in uh, in pa in Palestine and in Gaza that we don't like are going to be ignored if we just dumb it all down to something as simple as if they put down their weapons, they don't exist. If they if Palestine puts down their weapons, they can be liberated. It's like, yeah, that, that ignores the reality of the situation uh, on the ground there. And we can't actually come to a solution if we are entertaining that type of argument. Yeah, I, I, I was wondering what was going on. I've seen uh, the the bin Laden letter trending in, in a bunch of ways. And I, I was I haven't had time to look look quite yet what was going on. But that's really funny. I saw someone I don't remember who it was some neocon saying something like, Oh, yeah, and they're just gonna believe the letter. I'm like, what are you talking? Like, since when do we not like actually take people at their word? Like, imagine, <laughs> imagine that the, the, you know, the, the reality of like bin Laden being like, hmm, man, I really hate, I really, really hate how all these Americans have freedom. But I don't want them to know that. So what can I? Oh, you know what? They've been bombing us. That's a that's a really good scapegoat. That's what I'll put in this. Like, what an absurd conclusion. Well, what's um, the? Um, I can't remember the, the like the. Oh, I've, I found a, the Constitution in the desert, and like these people are free. I yeah. gotta go go get them. I, I forgot the point I was trying to make is that in his letter he cited like, "Hey, America, you voted for the people that killed all the people in my yeah. countries, and that's what justifies me in doing 9-11. and like. So that if you want to have that same logic with Hamas, like go right ahead. I don't think that logic is good. I don't think that logic is moral. Um, I think that's wrong. Uh, but just know that if that's the 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 moral reason you're applying to Hamas, like you you would agree with Bin Laden targeting the the two towers. And I'm and okay it, going to that simple of a of an analogy uh, well, if, if someone's going to use like Josh Reed Eagle. Yeah, because well, it's funny because people who who argue about blowback always get called. Oh, you're just an apologist for Bin Laden. Yeah. You're just saying it's like actually no. If right now, if you're the ones who are uh, saying that it's justified to to bomb Hamas or take them out because they voted for them, then actually you're the Bin Laden sympathizer here. For just to be clear, um, <laughs> two can play at that game, I guess. Um, but yeah, the I just think that there's like a there's just so much. Even if you didn't, even if you wanted to take the tact of you know both sides in this conflict are not equivalent yeah like again no one wants to say that there's a direct equivalency or that like hamas was justified or moral in what they did obviously not and if we even grant that let's say that everything israel did let's just for some reason say that it was totally moral every single thing they've done and i think that creating hamas is pretty immoral let's just look at it from a practical perspective okay so your your first sort of aim here is to create Hamas. That's sort of your first neocon <laughs> type, uh, you know, we're going to form their culture for them and, and build the world in, in democracy, except it's the democracy that we control. Uh, what was the cost of that? Well, it was clearly October 7th, as well as every other instigation of an attack that Hamas has made. So whether or not it was morally justifi justified, it's already cost you a ton. Okay, great. Uh, so now, Let's look and see, like, if we continue to do things like bombing civilians and innocents, will there be a cost in retaliation? And I think that if you look at the U.S.'s policy, I think that you can see that every time we've gone in and done indiscriminate bombing, every time we've gone in and, you know, taken out terrorists and, you know, a couple weddings along the way, we create another terrorist organization inevitably to come after us. It should be clear that if Israel goes down this path, 
the costs, much like creating Hamas, will be much worse in the long run. So even if you do, even if you want to grant complete moral immunity to Israel's side, just from a practical standpoint, it makes no sense. It again, the posture Josh uh, Equal takes here is if Israeli put down their weapons, we're not asking them to put down their weapons in the sense of like just surrender yourselves and let another Hamas attack happen to you. But we are saying that maybe you shouldn't go in and indiscriminately bomb civilians and do things that will cause blowback later. There's so many different angles you can take with this. And uh, he manages to construct a scarecrow that embodies none of the actual views that that at least serious people are saying. Yeah. I'm sure that there are some, you know, uh, college campus kids that are just fine Hamas that you know, if you want to pull a Ben Shapiro and go debate them, go ahead. But somehow I think that me comparing Josh equal to uh, Shapiro is probably more uh, more hateful than anything else I've said on this podcast to him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did, have you seen the the beef between him and Candace Owens? <laughs> yes. It's pretty I funny. Have. It is pretty funny. I have. Oh, man. So many disappointing things, but it's all I, good. We're. I will say, I will say, I just saw this morning. Uh, I don't know if you saw Jeremy Boring. Uh, the the he had a good one on it. He had a great take on that. Um, I I guess he's not currently acting as the CEO of Daily Wire because he's doing another project. But he came back and tweeted a great thing on that where he basically said we wouldn't fire her. her, We wouldn't. Yeah, even if I could, I wouldn't because we allowed dissension. So I thought that was a wonderful take. Um, and then you know that's kind of the spirit of of making fun of takes here too. It's like even if we disagree with these people, we don't want them to be shut down. So yeah, of course Keep spewing not. your good or bad. Takes, you wouldn't have so any we'll... more content. No. Exactly. Exactly. No, I mean, that's, that's a symbiotic a relationship. Of, yeah. That's a symptom. I mean, it, it debate is good, right? Like, yes. and, and like we've invited people like users that have commented and, and said things that we disagree with and we've taken it apart. We've invited them on and no one's taking us up on it yet, but um, you know, it's debate is great. We all get smarter because of it. And yeah, it's, it's necessary. Yeah. I, I I just wish I just hope that like when you are and and you know call us out too uh, if we're not doing this but steel man the most you can you know don't don't make takes like this where you're saying like oh everyone who doesn't want Israel to bomb innocent civilians just wants them to you know lie down and take it you know no that's not what the, the claim is I think Israelis have a right to defend themselves from an attack like Hamas did on October seventh and what they did was horrible uh, but let's also recognize that there are very real things that occur in a world that trigger cause and, and effect. And we need to be careful that we don't trigger them more. Uh, and also that you should be engaging in policy that is ethical as well. That involves not killing innocent people. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, folks, that will do it for us for this show. Thank you so much for hanging out and we'll catch you on the next one. Mm-hmm.